Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Welsh Republic podcast, episode 62. And I am here with my guest, Megan Fox. She's an award-winning journalist who works at PG, PJW Media and also is the host of the Fringe podcast there. How are you doing today, Megan? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. What have you been up to? Anything much today? Well, I'm doing a whole bunch of uh, research on uh, the American School Counselors Association. I've been working on that for a couple of weeks now, exposing what the American School Counselors are doing. That's been on PJ Media. Um, we're, we're talking about how all this woke stuff that is being pushed into education. A lot of parents think that it's being pushed by teachers. Um, and what we've discovered through Courage is a Habit and Alvin Louis, I don't know if you know who Alvin is, but he's really great to have. You should have him on sometime. He's great. He is a father who has been researching this stuff. And what he's found is that it appears that the belly of the beast is really the school counselors association. And the materials that they're sneaking into schools that are saying, we don't have that in our curriculum. We don't have critical race theory or gender theory or queer theory in our curriculum. Well, that might be true, but they do have it in the SEL program that the school counselors are pushing into the kids. Um, and they are doing this through circle time and SEL programming. They call it social emotional learning, which sounds really good. But then there's this, all the stuff involved in it that is they're sneaking in the critical race theory, gender theory, queer theory. Um, that's where all the transgender stuff is coming from. So that's what I've been working on. Did you find anything, any story lately that you found very disturbing? Oh, goodness. I find it very disturbing that the children's hospitals across this country are taking part in transgender surgeries for children, what they're calling gender affirming surgeries. But they're doing these, you know, it's one thing if you're 18. I mean, it's my opinion that when you're 18, when you're an adult, you know, you have a, a right to abuse yourself in any way that oh, yeah, absolutely. you but want to abuse. To the kids. Megan? Yeah, no uh, kids. <laughs> Could we first talk about more of yourself, how you became a journalist and how you became sure. this, and then we can move on to that. So, Megan, sure. I saw that on your bio that you worked for a ABC Radio and Primetime you know, Radio Network. What made you want to become a journalist? And who was the news when you were younger, like watching television and studying journalism? Who was the one role model you looked up to and what? was like any political leader who made you want to become like a well new supporter and what made you want to become one people will laugh at this and i don't i'm not sure if anyone will believe me because i was an unusual kid um i was very political i was involved in the watching the news and reading the news from the time i was about 11 or 12 and my parents were both very politically aware and they would have these uh, magazines sent to the house. And one of them was um, The American Spectator. And the other one was uh, The National Review. And in those days, they came, one of them was a newspaper and the other one was a magazine. And Ann Coulter uh, was writing in that way back then. And that was many, many years ago. And I, re I loved Ann Coulter's writing. I always have. And I also, Peggy Noonan was another... Um, columnist who was in writing for the National Review at the time, I believe. And so I loved Peggy's writing and I loved Anne's writing. And I also loved the cartoons, the political cartoons that were in those newspapers, in those periodicals. Um, and so I fought, I used to, I was such a nerd as a kid, I would clip those cartoons, these political cartoons by Michael Ramirez. I still remember who wrote them. Uh, and I would keep them in like this photo album that I had. I would just find them so funny and I would keep them. So I was really very influenced by um, political cartoons and commentary. I've always been influenced by comedy. Um, and I've always believed that Ann Coulter is one of uh, the funniest women. I mean, she's, she's got sharp edges, but she's very, very funny. Um, and so I would say Peggy Noonan, Ann Coulter, Michael Ramirez, and then also, um, of course, Rush Limbaugh, when I was about 15, is when I discovered his program through my sister, who was listening to him at when she was in college. So I began listening. What year was this? Oh, well, that would have been 1992, about 1992. 
because I graduated mm -hmm. in 94. So yeah, I was probably a sophomore in high school in about 92. And I started listening to Rush every day and it would normally coincide with a, um, with classes because I was in school and it would be noon and I'd be sticking earphones in my, underneath my hair. I had very long hair and I would. Yeah. The old, my... the old audio jacks, like, you yeah, know, the little AM, AM FM. I had like a tiny, I had a tiny little AM FM. It was about this big, just an AM FM with a little hedge phone jack that you stick in, you know, you can put the head earbuds in and I would hide it under my shirt and I would listen to that instead of my history teacher, <laughs> 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 which was to me was a good, uh, ex it was, I had a good excuse because she was very far left and she was always doing political lessons instead of teaching history. And I just got tired of listening to it. So I checked out and I was listening to Rush instead. Um, and then I, I started when I was working as a secretary, I was doing just secretarial work. Um, I had gone to college for a little while, but I decided I didn't want to do that. So I started working and doing secretarial work and I was doing, um, temp jobs. I was working a temp job as a secretary and I was, I would listen to AM radio. I was in Chicago. I would listen to the great WLS every single day. And that was Russia's affiliate at the time. And I heard an ad one day uh, for premier radio networks, which was his syndicator. And they were hiring for a marketing position, like a secretarial marketing position in Chicago. And um, I sent my resume immediately. I remember dropping everything I was doing and I got my resume together and I sent it in and I got an interview and I got hired. I, the, the man who hired me was, um, he loved that I loved Rush and that I had a passion for the show. And I think that was the most important thing to him because uh, he spent the next several years complaining about the way I put staples a, in paper. A, ABC Radio. This was with ABC Radio. This um, was with a syndicator called Premier Radio Network. So they were the oh, network that great. actually syndicated Rush Limbaugh across the United States. Um, so a syndicator is a little different than a radio station. What we would do is we would have uh, all these radio stations around the country that would carry our programs. And so we carried Rush Limbaugh, Dr. Laura, um, Michael Reagan, uh, Jim Rome, lots and lots. Oh, Art Bell, back in the day when Art Bell was on the air with his uh, Coast to Coast, uh, we carried that. So I was working with the, I was in marketing. So I would send headshots, like photo, sign photographs of these, of the talent to the different affiliates and they would hand them out to advertisers or whatever. I would do stuff like that. I would um, do new paperwork for new affiliates. It, it was, it was uh, fun. It was really fun. I got to go to radio and records conventions for the first time. And then I, when they moved their office to New York, because they decided to move premier radio to New York, I, um, my boss helped me get a job at ABC radio, which was still in Chicago. That would be WLS where rush was carried. So I moved over there, um, to stay in Chicago. I didn't want to go to New York. And, um, I started working for four radio stations there. It was ABC. Uh, which That's was, a lot of radio stations. A lot. It was, a lot. It was, it was X, uh, WXCD, which was an FM country station. At the time, it was a rock and roll station, but it's changed a few times. A talk radio station, WLS. I worked for um, ESPN 1000 and Radio Disney. And I was doing similar things, uh, marketing uh, secretarial. I would do voiceover sometimes when they asked when they would need somebody to read a commercial. Sometimes I would go do that. I, I got a the, little experience what sitting in on voiceover. What was the funniest voiceover you did for any advert? Like what, what type of advert? Oh gosh, I don't even remember. I just remember reading off scripts. You know, they would just hand me something and I would read. It would be it was pretty boring. It would be like, you know, on Saturday, on Saturday, January 5th, come down to the Ford dealership at such and such highway for whatever. <laughs> you know, it was it was not exciting at all, but it was fun for me to get behind a microphone. <laughs> Did you do any like a uh, voiceover for like any you know bed and breakfast or like <laughs> furniture advert? Furniture, advert furniture. Saying, yeah, you know. I think down. I did do one for furniture. Like, come down to Value City on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I may have. Yes. <laughs> oh, that yeah. must have been a really cool experience. You know what was funny is that for Radio Disney, I used to for extra money. <laughs> this is how hard up I was in my 20s for extra cash. I would go with the Radio Disney van to their um, events. They would have like events where they'd show up in parking lots and blast music and sing with kids and stuff and do dancing and games with kids. 
So I would put on my Mickey Mouse ears and my poodle skirt and go out with the Disney <laughs> van and uh, sing and dance with little kids for Radio Disney. Oh, that is very cool. <laughs> it was. I took my grandma one time and she was in a wheelchair. And it's the cutest picture. I have it around here somewhere uh, of her uh, in the crowd sitting in her wheelchair watching me sing and dance with little children. She loved it. What's What was your favorite song to sing, you know, with the kids and like doing and what what was your favorite Disney movie and series? Um. Gosh. Well, the favorite thing we used to do, uh, my favorite thing that we used to do with them for Radio Disney was the hula hoop contest. Uh, we would give out hula hoops to all the kids in the parking lot and, you know, see who could keep it up the longest. Um, and then uh, my favorite Disney movie probably has to be The Little Mermaid. I was obsessed with The Little Mermaid when I was when it came out. I think I was about 12 at the time. And it has remained a, a favorite of mine. What's your thoughts on the new one? Are you not a fan of the new one? Are you very disappointed with it? Or... No, I'm not disappointed. I, I don't know what the big deal is. I don't know why everybody's so upset about it. It's a fairy tale. <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> you know, we're talking about mermaids here. They're 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 fantastical creatures. Um, what I what I don't like about remakes in general is that and these how Disney continues to make live actions out of every movie they've ever made. Oh, it's absolutely outrageous. And they're going to be making another Lion King, a Mufasa prequel. Yeah, like, I mean, what, what is I'm the Muf bored. Mufasa prequel about? Like, it's the they're just doing it for money and like. The Star yes. Wars is just absolutely insane. That's the thing is that to me, it is the height of laziness to continue to remake the same movies over and over again. Why must they have a live action for every single cartoon they've ever done? Why aren't they coming up with new stories? I have appreciated their new stuff. Uh, like what was the one? Was that Disney? The, um, the We Don't Talk About Bruno one. That one was great. It was a or maybe that was Pixar, maybe it wasn't Disney. I don't know. Yeah, but I, I don't really know. I don't really know the new ones. The new I can't ones remember well. what it's called. But it that song was so so, um, you know, popular. But but the movie I thought was really good. I would prefer to see new things. I would prefer prefer to see new movies like Disney remaking Toy Story over and over again, or like just adding parts to it, or making this new Buzz thing is like. Just move on. Oh, the new Buzz Lightyear movie is terrible. I didn't see it. I have no Absolutely. desire to see it. Absolutely. And especially with the woke stuff that they're putting in. Right. Everybody's getting tired of that. I mean, it's just, and especially, did you see um in Big Hero 6, you know, where they had Baymax, where Baymax was basically like in a store and in the advert, he was basically giving tampons to kids. That's grooming. That's absolutely yeah, disgusting. You know, it is absolutely outrageous, you know. It's gross. I wish they would um, just get back to being creative. You know, those Imagineers that we grew up really, you know, in awe of, like, where are they? What are they doing? And, and why do they just keep remaking things? That's the thing that bothers me. I have no criticism at all to give about whoever's playing Ariel. I don't care. I don't care if it's an Asian girl or a, a black girl or I don't care. It doesn't bother me. What I don't understand is why they have to make the remake the movie at all. The, the, the animated version is wonderful. Um, and I, I just would rather see a new story. There's so many out there. Are you telling me you can't go through Grimm's fairy tales and find a new hit classic? I bet you could. That's absolutely true. So speaking of that, as you were saying about when you were working in radio, ABC and stuff, where was the moment where you found out that the A what, what did you realize that the ABC radio company was corrupt and it was starting to go the opposite way? Like what what made you join independent radio? Well, I'm trying to think. It wasn't so much that there was political stuff going on at the station. I was more involved in radio and radio than TV. There was a TV station there too. And I imagine that TV was a little more difficult. Radio has always been a little more conservative. And at the time that I was at WLS, it was a very conservative station with all conservative hosts. So I was in heaven. I loved it there. Um, I loved it. I loved sitting after work. I would go up to the studio and just sit in and watch Ro and Gary did, do did their you show. Ever, did you ever talk to Rush Limbaugh? Oh, yes. I've, I, I met Rush several times when I was working for him. And then again, um, in the future, I saw him again um, at another event. And 
and then he started reading my columns on his show. And um, so I kind of became a part of his program, which was really a dream come true because I had not imagined that that would happen. Um, and so it was really wonderful. I miss him a lot. And he read, sometimes he would read things from me. He would read two or three articles of mine a day. <laughs> and can, you, he even, can, you, can you remember what his favorite article article of yours, your, his favorite article of yours was? Uh, I don't know. He never told me, but I do remember one that made him laugh a whole lot. Uh, he really loved my acronym for LGBTQ because I would always call them LGBTQWTF. And because they keep adding letters and I don't know what the letters yeah, are yeah, and you yeah, cannot sorry. keep up with the plus plus A I S F F. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, hashtag symbol, I, you can't keep up. So I just made up my own acronym uh, and I, I called them LGBTQ WTF. And I remember when he read that in the first article where I wrote it, um, he, he was, he couldn't breathe. He was laughing so hard. So that made me laugh. that, I loved that, that he, and then he started using it, which was fun to hear him uh, pick it up and use it was a lot of fun. What was your favorite, um, like, quote of Rush Limbaugh that you really liked? And what was like your favorite, you know, story of his? Oh, God, so much. I think my favorite phrase that he used over and over again was it's, you know, I will tell you when it's time to panic. <laughs> He would say, it's not time to panic. And I will tell you if it's time to panic. Because I do think that the culture war is such um, a disaster and the, the world is so upside down that oftentimes people like me, conservatives, worried parents, we do feel like, oh, my God, is it time to panic? Should we panic? Is, the, is it now? <laughs> if not now, when? But he was always a really good calming voice of reason who would who would come on a Monday morning after a weekend of absolute hell and say, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> it's not time to panic. I will tell you when it's time. Um, so that was probably my favorite phrase of his because I relied on it a lot. Um, I miss his take on everything. I just miss it very much. I do find, though, strangely enough, because the two are not the same at all, but I find that Nick Ricada has filled a lot of that, um, the, what was missing for me in the humor and the, when he's not being a, to, you know, when he's not being a total goof, um, he can be quite poetic, as Rush always was, um, and very heartfelt in what he says and how he means it and how he communicates. It's really quite a gift to have that gift of communication that Rush had, you know, where he was able to talk to you on a level uh, where you felt like he was sitting across the table from you. You know, it wasn't just some guy on the radio. It was really just somebody, a friend. And that's the way that I, I see Nick Ricada's show and Ricada Law is that he's the same way. He's very, he's, he's very, he connects with his audience in a way that I, I saw Rush do. Um, and so in that way, I think he's, they're very similar. Mm -hmm. So speaking of that, you've been an investigator journalist, and I saw a story where you were trying to basically expose a public library for allowing men to like rape people or something for almost 10 years, you know, for the, for the fact that it took you 10 years to try and get something done, you know, and trying to expose that public library to do it, you know, how, like, how did you manage to finally expose it? And why did it take so long to expose that library for allowing that? Yeah, what the, what the library was doing was allowing men to watch pornography on their computers in broad daylight in public near children. They were steps away from the teen section. And in fact, the books that the kids would need for their um, history projects were like right behind the computer. So you could see what they were doing. Um, and not only were they just watching it, but there were several incidents that I uncovered in this library where men were masturbating and doing really gross things. Uh, one man had um, cornered a 17 year old in a study room. She was inside the study room and they had these windows that looked out into the library that you could see into the study room. And he was standing outside the window, like, ma like masturbating in front of the window, looking at her and there was no way out for her. And no one called the police. You know, these are things that should never happen. This is the Orland Park Public Library. 
And they had all these internal records of this stuff happening, of sexual harassment. Um, I, I would consider some of these things sex crimes. You know, that is a sex crime. You Exposing yourself to a, a minor uh, or anyone, for that matter, in public is a, is a sex crime. And they would not call the police. Or if someone, like a woman, complained one time that a man was masturbating watching porn, and they moved the woman instead of doing something about the oh, man. Absolutely ridiculous. So that we is. found, yeah, it's insane. My friend Kevin Dijon at the time, he had a, a website called hillbuzz.org. And I don't, it's not still um, in, it's not still up. But back then he was campaigning for Hillary uh, before when she was running against Obama. And when Obama won and the way Hillary was treated at the time really turned him off and he became very conservative. Um, and so he and I had kind of teamed up for this project and he helped me a great deal uh, write the book. And also he was instrumental in teaching me how to do FOIA, freedom of information requests, which is how we, we found all those internal reports where they didn't call police and should have. Uh, at the Orland Park Public Library. I wrote a book about it. I actually have a copy of it right here. I can show you the um, show you what it looks like. It's called Shut Up, The Bizarre War That One Public Library Waged Against the First Amendment. Um, and this is a really good book about uh, freedom of information and also how to do it, how to, how to get documents from public bodies. And also there's a ton of stuff in here that now relates to what parents are going through with the school boards. You know, yeah, with all this gender surgery rubbish and like, yes. And you know what's so messed up in Australia right now in Victoria and South Australia, they're pretty much going to be making a law that if you disagree with your kid, you know, having sex change operation, you could go to jail for that or you could case a fine. You know, it's happening a lot in Western Europe. And that's because Western Europe's going. It's just it's absolutely messed up, Megan. I know. I know. I was asking the other day, like, how long until these children's hospitals start medically kidnapping your kid? If you disagree with um, them, that uh, medical intervention is the way to go with a kid with gender dysphoria. I mean, I don't know how many more studies we need to see that show gender dysphoria in children mostly resolves after puberty. But if you stop puberty, it never resolves. It's like 80 some percent resolves on its own. But if you do what these doctors tell you to do, which is put them on puberty blockers, they have an almost 100% rate of moving on to HRT. It's like 98% of that's, kids put that's on. so dangerous. And, you know, because puberty blockers, you know, when the hormones are growing and everything in the body's trying to nature, like the hair, the, pub, the like pub public hair, the pubes and all that, and also the way the brain's developing, but then you're like giving drugs it can affect the DNA. It can affect this and that. And it also gives them brain damage too, you know, like the puberty blockers. I don't even understand. Like I saw your interview with the girl, uh, Jamie from gays against for gays against groomers. Very, very good page. Apparently they were just blocked off of PayPal, which was absolutely outrageous. And Venmo um, and Google has now taken their Google account away. I, I know. Absolutely ridiculous. And they do a fantastic job of exposing this rubbish. And it's they just do. like, I mean, it's absolutely insane, you know, like what, what what's going on, you know, Megan? I just don't understand what's going on with the heads of the West. Why is the West doing this? You know, especially here in New Zealand, you know, New Zealand is also pushing, you know, the transgender agenda, maybe not as bad as Canada or, or like Australia or England and stuff. But it's just, and I mean, someone in England got arrested for pretty much, you know, speaking out against the transgender rights, you know, and apparently those charges were dropped for just upsetting someone. And it's just, like, what is this nonsense? It's just like, I it's not I wish I knew. I wish I knew what where where this came from all of a sudden. But if you notice in England, there was just a big rally and the lesbians were kicked out of the uh, like, yeah, like, I like know, a pride right? event. So now lesbians are not welcome at a pride event because they want to protect women's dignity and spaces and privacy. I, I, they've gone too far. And, you know, I hate to be the one to point it out. I hate to say this, but I, at, at one point when gay marriage was the big argument happening in America, there were many of us saying, okay, listen, when does this stop? How far are we going to go? And we were told, this is it. This is as far as we're going to go. We just want to be like everybody else. We just want to be married like everyone else. That's all we want. Well, that clearly wasn't the case now, was it? Because as soon as that was legalized, 
it's more push, more push, more push, push for more of more now you more know, rights more we don't know we had, you know, all you these know, things. And all of those gay people that were fighting for gay marriage, look, I have nothing against gay marriage. I think gay marriage is fine. You're, you have nothing against gay marriage. Look, if you're someone who is a Christian, you disagree with gay marriage, that's absolutely fine. That doesn't bother me. That's all good. I respect that. But just think about all these people who fought for gay marriage and fought for the rights of gay people. And all they wanted to do was get married. But then there's all this, they did not fight for kids to be indoctrinated, for kids to, you know, get get sex change operations that pretty much destroy their DNA and pretty much destroy their, you know, bone narrative and also pretty much, you know, mess with, you know, their well-being. They didn't fight for that stuff. No. They didn't fight in order for kids to go to, you know, drag queen shows. You know, it's just uh, honestly. Which is me, why it's... Gay Lens Groomers is such a great organization. And it's bringing together a lot of, um, you know, gay and lesbian and bisexual people to say this is not what we fought for. And we're going to stand with parents. And I, I appreciate them to no end. I think that they I think they will be the ones to stop this uh, because it's really, you know, as a straight you know heterosexual as parents you know like we don't have the voice um necessary necessarily you, you, that you, you, can, you mean yeah. as a straight swiss woman <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like it, it's it's crazy it's like no one listens you know no one's going to listen to me because i'm just you know a boring straight white woman and um when other gay people speak out about this, I think it's very effective. I think it's very powerful. And I, uh, I appreciate um, uh, YouTubers like Mr. Menno, uh, listening to Mr. Menno, is, he's, he's wonderful. He's someone who's standing with the women in England to say, you know, their spaces should be private. And so should men's, by the way. He gave this wonderful talk about uh, going to a, a gay men's event and having to listen to a woman who had transitioned talk about what it's like to be a gay man and how crazy that is. Like, it's just crazy that women can now invade gay men's spaces, excuse me, and women can now demand that gay men date them. That's crazy. It's, it's as crazy as, tr as trans uh, women demanding lesbians date them. Lesbians don't like penises and it's ridiculous to it start ridiculous trying to make people, you know, yeah. It's well, crazy. As the Bible said, it's like Solomon and Gomorrah. You know, America, as they say today, is like ancient Babylon. You know, it's like ancient Babylon and it's like Solomon and Gomorrah. You know, one of the reasons why Solomon and Gomorrah is destroyed, you know, was because of wickedness, you know, and evilness, you know. And I also, you know, it, it, just to let you know, there was actually a toy that just came out and it's called, uh, it's called the butt baby. Did you see that? It's the butt baby. So apparently it's like a, pros a prostrated baby. I was that hoping that was a joke. In... No, it's real. It's I did real. see that. It's and real. I was hoping that that was like a 4chan prank because I can't, I, I can't even think about it. It's absolutely demonic. And, you know, speaking about demonic stuff, Megan, I also saw your article that you did, which is – absolutely fantastic article and i for everybody you should definitely check out this article that she did which she spoke to um do you want to show the article on here or do you think the channel will get a strike uh i don't know that's a good question because i don't know what youtube's um policy is but yeah you probably shouldn't show it because i mean i showed it the other day on a live stream but i don't know i don't know i don't know if you can or not uh but yeah the because the pictures are yeah, that's really okay. We can graphic. just we can just talk about it. Yeah, but I saw the article, and when I was reading the article, Megan, what the Oklahoma City Hospital were doing, allowing sixteen under six under sorry people kids under sixteen, pretty much telling them you know that it's okay for them to get the sex tra trans sex change operation, which pretty much is about healthcare when in fact it isn't, and pretty much telling them that it's going to help them, you know, and it's healthcare and it's going to be there to pretty much prevent them from committing suicide. But then yet they're doing like surgery where they're pretty much putting different skin parts into them from different donors. And like, 
that's so bad because all those surgeries, like how you had that surgeon who told you that basically most of these surgeries, you know, have negative effects. This is child abuse. This is disgusting. You know, and if you think about it, you know, this is like child pornography. This is like something seen in Saw or like a horror movie, you know, and, and yeah. the fact that this is being allowed is just absolutely outrageous. When you saw that story, Megan, seeing what the Oklahoma City was doing to these um Sorry, Megan, I'm trying to not get emotional, just trying not to... Um... No, I know, it's it's a really hard topic. You're ta we're talking about mutilating children mm -hmm. and the idea that people are not more up in arms about this and, and how come Billboard Chris is one guy, one dad, standing outside these hospitals with a, with a sandwich board and he's being met with hundreds of protesters and he's out there by himself with maybe two or three friends. How come there aren't more of us outside those hospitals? Why aren't more of us saying this is enough? This is wrong. Dr. Gabriel Del Coral, who's one of these phalloplasty surgeons, he actually put this on his own website. He said, I tell all my patients that the complication rate for phalloplasty can be 100%. It could be a small opening, but it's 100%. There is something that that is going to happen. And then he listed all the different things that are happening with going wrong. Now you tell me if this sounds like it's safe for children. Urethral complications, wound breakdown, pelvic bleeding or pain, bladder or rectal injury, lack of sensation, prolonged need for drainage, partial necrosis or flap loss, dissatisfaction with the size or shape of the penis, need for further procedures, and then the donor site risks, you know, because they take the skin from the arm and they make it like you basically just have a bone left. It's sick. It's completely mutilated for life. That has wound breakdown, decreased mo mobility, hematoma, pain, decreased sensation, excessive scarring, hypergranulation, slowing down wound healing, and raising risks of infection, adhesions, a brand of scar tissue that binds two parts of tissue together. So you're talking about a whole lot of that doesn't sound safe at all that sounds disgusting evil manic just like it, it is it, it's what the bible talks about you know whether you believe in the bible or not the bible's got a point you know this is in the end times men will become wicked and you know jesus talks about this stuff and man you know it, 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 it's even worse than solomon gomorrah i mean solomon gomorrah i think it is worse i yeah, do i think it's you know, worse Kids getting there. Well, obviously, we're living in an age which you could argue is kind of like the book of Enoch times in the days of Noah, where they were doing pretty weird things. But like this, like these bone marrow surgeries where kids are basically getting bone put on them is so bad because you it could also lead to diseases, cancer. They could get cancer from this. They could get brain damage from this. They could even end up vomiting, you know, blood from this, like all that amnesia and all that, you know, it's it's not natural. Like what is wrong with these people? And oh puberty is the most natural God. thing in the world. I mean, stopping puberty for all of these children without knowing what the long-term consequences are, because this has never been done before on this kind of scale. Puberty blockers historically have been used to stop precocious puberty for a very short period of time. Puberty blockers were never meant to stop puberty altogether. And the idea that they've been telling parents with children that this is totally reversible and there are no side, there are no long-term effects, they're lying once you for if you stop puberty as a boy um for sure the penis does not continue to grow so they will be stuck with a micro penis what's called a micro penis which i don't think any man really wants to have and so if they decide to change their minds and go back it's not like it's just going to keep growing again it doesn't do that that's not how it works and if you they, know there was a german doctor that came out and literally i remember watching a video that came out a long time sorry for interrupting you no you're fine that, um there was a german doctor that came out and i remember watching a video and that German doctor said it is scientifically impossible to change a gender. Like every blob, blob, blood of drop of blood you have contains billions examples of DNA. And also there was this other doctor to say that a lot of people who want to have sex, cha sex change operation and sex change surgery is because they were abused. It was because they didn't have a father in the home. And that just, and you talk about, you know, they're not being a father figure and all the media, you know, pretty much doing all this venomous agenda and brainwashing kids and stuff. It's just, it's so messed up, May Megan. It really oh, is. So you, many, 
so many of these kids not only don't have a father in the home, many of them have mental disorders from ADHD to, um, uh, what was the other, oh, to autism. So many of these children who are going through, uh, who say they have gender dysphoria are actually autistic. The numbers of autistic children being targeted by this are astronomically high. Oh, and that is so, so and, wrong. And, and you know something? The, these A lot of these people supporting this will be like, oh, we, we support freedom and transparency and we support respect. How are you guys being respectful when you're taking advantage of people which taking advantage and you're going to give sex change operations that's pretty much going to kill someone or pretty much give them an infection or pretty much going to give them cancer? Yeah, sure. Scientifically, that's very, very... Oh. <laughs> Just well, it also, it makes them a lifetime patient. So you're taking a health, perfectly healthy child. And then what you're doing is turning them into a pharmaceutical uh, dependent patient for the rest of their lives. This is not something that you eventually stop going to the doctor for. I mean, there are monthly checkups. There are, um, you're going to be monitored by healthcare forever at that point. These girls who are getting their breasts chopped off, uh, calling it top surgery when it's really a double mastectomy, they will never know what it feels like to nurse their own baby. They may never have a baby because they're sterilizing these kids. Puberty blockers then moved on to hormone therapy, sterilizes children. It is, this is, this is horror show stuff. This is lobotomies. This is sterilizing the mentally ill that, that was happening in the 60s that we now look back on and we think, who were those monsters? And we make movies about it. And we, you know, we say to ourselves, we would never allow that to happen again. Well, it's happening again. So you have to ask yourself, am I one of the ones allowing it or am I speaking out against it? Because this is happening again. I know exactly. And, you know, I just want to say respect, you know, to the unwoke podcast. Is that the same unwoke podcast guy for doing that, uh, for spreading your awareness about this, you know, and showing it. Absolutely respect for him, you know. He's someone I love to bring on my show. You know, I see he's doing really good work, and you know, to see those photos and to see that is just Oklahoma City Hospital. I mean, it's so disgusting for them to be doing that. They should not be. Yeah, doing they're. That. They are actually, so Oklahoma is not doing the surgeries at the hospital, but they are facilitating finding surgeons to do those surgeries for these children. Um, what they are doing at the Oklahoma hospital is HRT, hormone therapy, and puberty blockers, and all this gender affirming stuff where they set them on a pathway where there's no other option for them but to go through surgeries. And look, I come from the generation that learned how to be a child uh, from Mr. Rogers. And I, I don't know if you're familiar since you're in New Zealand. Do you, did you ever watch Mr. Rogers in New Zealand? Do they have that there? I think, I think I've heard of him. What was the TV series called Mr. Rogers? It was just called Mr. Rogers neighborhood. And it was, it was Mr. It was Fred Rogers, who was just the sweetest man on earth who would, he would talk to you every day as a child, you know, it was like, children's programming and he would show you something new every day but one of the things that he always did and he had these fun puppet shows that he would do but one of the things he always talked about and i mean it was a constant theme was you are good just the way you are you were made every one of you made specially made different than the next one and so he would bring it and this was way back in the 80s he would bring a child in a wheelchair um, on the program and he would talk to the child in the wheelchair and what was it like what's it like to be in a wheelchair and what do you what do you wish and hope for and what are you good at and it was just a really good way to to show children that yes everybody's different and everybody has their own challenges but you're all good the way you are and he would also talk about the differences between boys and girls and how those were good differences and good it's good to be different i i don't know how we went from that <laughs> to like he was always about the self-esteem you know about loving yourself loving whatever this disability is that you have if you have everyone has something some challenge to if you don't like yourself we go to a surgeon and hack off body parts what I just, just will never downfall, understand it. The downfall of Western civilization that, you know, from the media that the globalist elite have been planning. I mean, this has been something, you know, to destroy the nuclear family, destroy masculinity. You know, it's just, it's absolutely outrageous, Megan. You know, it is. 
it's not good. And, you know, each day it seems to get worse. I don't know if you saw the viral photos going around of the Canadian teacher in the giant prosthetic uh, breasts with yep. nipples I poking saw through that. his it's shirt. Clown world, isn't it? It's clown world. When you it's saw clown that, world. when you saw that, were you, what was your emotion as a mother? And if you, let's say, if you had your kids going to that school and then someone was there, with those, <laughs> what would you do? Oh, well. Uh, they wouldn't be going back to that school until that teacher was t dealt with. Uh, I will tell you that much. I would absolutely have them pulled from. I, I would be. I would be at the board meeting. I'd be in the superintendent's office. There'd be you. There'd be no end of hearing from me, uh, if because that what that is. And my initial. You asked me what my reaction was as a mother. I was horrified and angry that a man is allowed to bring his sexual fetish in front of and involve children in it, in school. It's absolutely outrageous. It is clearly a sexual fetish. Those prosthetic breasts he's wearing are clearly a sex toy. Um, that is what they are used for. I mean, come on. This guy gets off on uh, what he's doing, and he's doing it in front of children, which makes him, in my opinion, a child predator. He's contributing to the delinquency of minors, and he should be charged for it. But, of course, Canada, uh, Canada, Canada is so, so gone um, that they are, they're just, they're going to defend this guy and let the children be harassed like this. And it's, it's hard to believe. Mm -hmm. I saw that you were getting a bit emotional earlier when we were talking about the whole, were you getting a bit emotional when we were talking about the whole, you know, the photos, you know, that we saw, because I was trying not to tear up. Sorry about that. I was a bit emotional for me. <laughs> Do you mean the, uh, of the, the donor sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I was, I was, I was actually tearing up a bit. You know. Yeah, it's thinking. not good. It's not good. I mean, I don't know how you could. I mean, look, anybody who wants to see this, just Google phalloplasty donor sites, and you'll see what we're talking about. When you take a healthy child and you carve them up like this, you give them scars for life, and you think there isn't, there's not going to be a negative consequence later. It's just outrageous. Look, there's so many detransitioners now coming out and saying, this, the people who pushed me down this road should be sued into oblivion because I am now unhappy, in pain, uh, with no way to go back and no one to help me. The thing they don't tell you is this. If they do all these Franken surgeries to you, these doctors who claim to be these, you know, that they're helping transgender people. If they do all this stuff to you and you decide, I didn't, I don't like this at all. I want to go back. There's no one to help you. There's no one who specializes in detransitioning. So when these people find out, oh no, this was the wrong thing. And I'm, I wasn't born in the wrong body and I should have learned how to accept myself. There isn't any medical community support anywhere for those people. Now, how is that possible? How is that ethical that a medical community could set up all this so-called gender affirming care, but no care for gender, for the gender transition to decide, uh-oh, this was a mistake. As someone, hey, as the older generation used to say, sometimes you, you can do things in life that you will regret. And if you do things that you regret, you've got to face the consequences. But how does it and how does a 13 year old uh, really understand the consequences of, of they, these don't. Things? they don't they, they can't consent. They cannot consent legally to any medical procedure. And so they're relying on the consent of the parents and the parents are being coerced. They're being coerced through fear. I think a lot of these parents, I think some of them want the attention like Jazz Jennings mother. Um, I think some of them thrive on the attention of it and on the acceptance level of it. But I think most of them are just bullied into it by the doctors claiming that if you don't do this, your kid's gonna commit suicide. So what would you rather have, a, a live son or a dead daughter? And that's literally what they tell them. And I think it's really cruel and it is coercion. It is not consent to put something that is so false out there as if it's a done deal that's, uh, that your child is going to commit suicide if they're not allowed to chop up their body parts. That's outrageous and ridiculous and no scientific study backs it. They keep pulling out these studies that say that transgender affirming therapy helps suicide rates go down. Well, when you look at the bottom of all of these so-called studies and surveys, you find another paragraph that says, this survey should not be used to determine anything about the suicide rate in transgender people. 
So they're using studies that are not meant to be used in that way to say that it's doing something the studies don't say they do. There are no studies that say that suicide rates in transgender people are going down because of affirmative uh, gender surgeries. It's actually the opposite. There are some studies out there now showing that kids who go down these paths actually are still struggling with suicidal thoughts and suicidal ideation. And that's just gonna continue to rise until people wake up and realize that what was wrong in the first place never needed a medical intervention. It needed therapy. Uh, it needed time and patience and puberty and uh, continually having adults in their lives who will say to them, I know that being a girl is hard. I know that puberty is terrible for you. It is not fun to have a period. It is not fun to grow breasts. None of that is any, any fun. Eventually though, honey, it will get better and you will feel comfortable in your body and you will be a beautiful woman. And this is a tough time. That's what they need to hear. They do not need to hear, let's just get you on some hormones and you won't have a period ever again. If you mm -hmm. told me at 12 or 13, whenever I got my period, that you wouldn't have to go through this if you took this drug, you think I wouldn't take it? Of course I would. Any girl going through puberty, getting her period for the first time, would trade her a, a body part to not have that anymore. It's not fun to realize that you're going to have to do this every month for the you know, almost the rest of your life. Um, and that's part of the reason I think that this is such a huge, it, we're seeing a huge increase in girls going through this because no one has bothered to sit down with them and talk about puberty and how hard it is and recognize what they're going through and give them encouragement, not hormones. You know, giving them the right narrative, you know, which they need, you know, basically, because my generation like i'm in my mid 20s and i feel like it, when i was 13 and 12 my generation was really the last generation who grew up without all this you know transgender stuff and then after 2013 or 15 came in and you know it's i don't know what to say megan anyways speaking about the transgender thing i also saw the story about how that 10 year old girl who got raped and like Th that was absolutely outrageous and the fact that there was not you know the fact that they didn't charge the rapist was insane you know th th seeing that you know you talk about that with jesse waters on his show i just don't understand that you know how that could be allowed well, to get through it they did charge him um, and he well, they did? oh, that's oh yes but see here was the problem the problem with that story from the very beginning was this all the media, it started in the Indianapolis Star, and they reported this as an abortion story. It was ab about abortion. It wasn't about the rape of a 10-year-old. The rape of the 10-year-old was kind of like an after effect, an afterthought. You know, that's how they treated it. It was, it was, oh, look how terrible this is that this child had to go out of state to get an abortion because oh, of yeah, Roe I v. Wade. Yeah, I did hear it about wasn't, it. It wasn't, and, and nobody even mentioned the rapist in the Indianapolis Star. And that is why I started questioning it. It went all over the world in a matter of a couple of days. It became this huge viral story. And all the, the uh, media that reported it. They basically just repeated the Indianapolis Star's story without doing any investigative reporting of their own. Not one reporter asked, who is the rapist? We have a pregnant 10 year old. She's being raped probably at home. Someone needs to find the rapist. Yeah, so that's, that's when I, it's that's when I started funny. asking the questions and the attorney general of Ohio started asking questions and he asked law enforcement and law enforcement in Ohio, including Columbus, told the attorney general of the state that they didn't have a case. They didn't have anybody. They said they didn't have anybody arrested for this crime. Now, that was a lie because after he went and made that statement public, that was the night I was on Jesse Waters and we were just questioning the narrative. We were saying, if this story is true, and we're starting to think it isn't because Caitlin Bernard, the doctor, and she's an activist abortionist. Um, and so she's very good at getting media attention. And this is one of those things that they do every time abortion is threatened. They, they make up, they say that the worst case scenario will happen. Well, is there any worse case scenario than a 10 year old being raped and not being able to get help? Uh, no, there's no worse case scenario than that. The, the night after that we were on Fox, Suddenly there's an arrest in Columbus and they have the guy. And what is, he's an illegal alien from Guatemala. And he was living in the home with the child and other children. 
And it turns out that the mother, so Telemundo did some really good reporting, gets down, finds the mother. Mother says it wasn't him. He didn't do it. Of course, DNA testing proved that he did. So she was covering up for him. We don't even know. Was this a human trafficking organization? Because were the kids even related to them? I got a building manager on the phone uh, who was in the building manager where they lived and saw them move in with no girl, just two boys. They never saw a girl. Where'd the girl come from? Did the authorities investigate them for human trafficking? We know that they're not legal. They're not here legally. So are they part of, are they connected to the cartel? No, none of the, jur the journalists who reported on this story did any of this digging, did any of these, asked any of these questions. It wasn't until because I started- they're all bought out. They're all bought out and they're all controlled. It was all about abortion in Roe v. Wade. It wasn't mm -hmm. about this poor little girl and how she got here. And in this situation where she's in, being raped multiple times by this person in her own home, and we still don't know because authorities in Ohio won't tell us if authorities took custody of her. We still don't know. We don't know. She could still be with her mother. We don't know. Um, and they won't tell us. Now, the, the man who is the accused rapist, he is in jail awaiting his trial. And the trial has been set for really quickly. I have to check the calendar again. Uh, and I, I remember thinking when I saw the date, like, oh, I've never seen a trial that quick. So it's it's a little interesting. And as soon as I as soon as that came out that he was an illegal alien, the mainstream press dropped the story entirely. They wanted nothing to do with it anymore. Absolutely ridiculous, you know. So Megan, before we we're almost up to the hour point, before we finish up, as an American, with the way America is going and with the way it's going, a lot of people say America could be heading into civil war. There was a survey I saw in Tucker Carson where he pointed out 40% of Americans think civil war could end up be happening, 42%. And a lot of people think that America won't be a superpower at the end of this decade. Do you think that if Donald Trump or DeSantis was going to it was to come in in 2024, do you see America heading into civil war? Or do you see America being saved in a way? Or do you think it's most likely that something's going to happen in 2024 and basically, you know, nations like Florida and Texas and New Hampshire are going to succeed? Do you think we're going to see like a union separation or do you think it's going to be most likely civil war? And are you also optimistic for the future of America? I do not think we're going to see civil war in, in our lifetime, to tell you the truth, in America. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's much more likely that the United States will balkanize. I think we're already seeing that happening now. We already we, we joke a lot about a great national divorce, but it's kind of already happening. Um, I think ideally that would be better than any civil war. I'm very, very against war um, and I hate the idea of it. And I think anyone who thinks that that's an answer um, are, are really fooling themselves and have not studied the American Civil War closely enough in the horrors that happened there with Abraham Lincoln having to write letters to families uh, for fallen soldiers for four to five children in one family that he had to write letters of condolence to a mother for losing all five of her children. Um, I don't think people have quite gotten it through their heads how horrific a civil war in America would be again. Um, and so, no, I, I think what we're most likely headed towards is is red states will become redder and blue states will become bluer and people will vote with their feet and move to places where people agree with them. We're already seeing that in Texas, Governor Abbott has outlawed gender surgery for children. He has declared that it is abuse. The legislature has, has written a law that it is abuse. Uh, and they will investigate it as abuse in Texas. All the Texas clinics had to stop doing gender affirming um, hormones and surgeries on children. Thank God. Uh, and I think Tennessee is looking at doing the same thing. So you're going to see red states get redder and blue states get bluer. The red states are restricting abortion. Blue states are lifting restrictions on abortion. Um, and so we're going to have to move where people agree with us and where people are uh, sane. If we want to be in a sane place, we have to move to a sane place. I unfortunately still live in New York and I probably will be here until retirement. So I'm stuck here. But if you can move, you should move to a place where people are more like you. Although the news out of Oklahoma does not make me feel so good about Oklahoma being such a red state and yet allowing this to go on at the Oklahoma Children's Hospital is outrageous. Um, as far as 
Trump or DeSantis in 2024, I really don't have a very high opinion of national politics. Uh, and I don't think it makes much of a difference who's in the White House, really, to be honest. What really makes a difference are the bureaucrats that are unelected causing the most problem in American life. We have a lot of unelected bureaucrats that are pushing through policies that affect us far more than laws do in some instances, like all these school policies where girls are not allowed privacy in their own bathrooms anymore. That's not a law. Those are policies instituted by the Department of Education. You know, the unelected bureaucrats are the ones who are choking freedom in America. It isn't the elected politicians doing it, although some of them are not helping. Because a lot of them, as we all know from the book, The Creature of Jekyll Island and Ed the Fed from Ron Paul, they're all controlled by the Federal Reserve and the corporations. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. And another thing is America should needs to, you know, go back to being the constitutional republic it was before the conservative, you know, before the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, which turned America from a constitutional republic to an empire, you know, and I think if America did that, it needs to make the judges follow the constitution again, it needs to make every state follow the constitution like it was, you know, all that, etc. I agree. No, I agree with that very much. And I think a lo- on the local level, you can make the most change, and that's where elections count the most. Getting too worked up over a, who's in the White House is not beneficial for anybody. Uh, the, the president really doesn't have as much power as, the, as your local health, health department, which we have found out through COVID. So if you really want to make a difference, go after those positions. Go after the local health department, your local school board, your local library board. Change mm-hmm. the people on those things and you will see change spread. Make sure that you have constitutionalists in those positions and you will see constitutionalism spread. Um, and um, also, and also, if you want to fix the economy, make the gold the standard again because in 1971, Richard Nixon did that. You look at how bad the United States has been falling economically. It's just absolutely outrageous for them, you know, to, because if you look at what Russia's doing at the moment, ever since they made the gold the standard, they've been getting, you know, really strong economically. Yeah. I mean, finance is not my area of expertise, so I can't really speak to that as much, but I do think that on a local level, people need to really, really do more paying attention to what's, who's running things just in their own town. And making sure that it's it's in line with their values and their uh, what they want for their children. It is absolutely possible to change your school board and to get rid of the woke policies that are harming children and and leading them down these roads roads to surgeries and and pain and sterilization. It's it's absolutely possible to keep that out of your school. Mm-hmm. So before we finish off, Megan, is there anything else you would like to say? Well, um, you know, you can follow my columns every every day on pjmedia.com. Uh, you can go under columnist, click on my name. You can find all of the columns that I'm working on. If you become a VIP subscriber, I have a podcast every week that is for my VIP subscribers on PJ Media, where I talk about, you know, things that I'm writing on, investigating what's coming up next, et cetera. And also my YouTube page. Please do visit my YouTube page. Um, hopefully you can throw a link in the description or something. Uh, but yeah, we'll the, absolutely do that. I will yeah. absolutely. Mm-hmm. And anything else you'd like to say? Any quote you'd like to give to the audience before we finish? Just be courageous, be brave, stand up for what you believe, stand up for, your, for the kids. The kids really need us right now. They need the adults. Uh, in the room to stand up and say no to some of this outrageous money-making scheme that's being pushed on kids by the pharmaceutical industry and the medical industry who doesn't care about your kid, but they sure do care about those dollars. And they know that the, these surgeries are bringing in hundreds of thousands of dollars per patient. And we need to realize, wake up and realize that these people do not care about children. They care about the dollars. So stand up for your children and be courageous. Mm-hmm. Thank you for coming on my show, Megan. It was an absolute pleasure to have you. And please, everybody, check out her article. She makes absolutely brilliant articles. Check out the books she's written. And I just want to say to everybody, thank you for joining the Watch Republic podcast, episode 62. It was a pleasure, you know, having Megan on my show. Thank you for coming on. And I just want to say to everybody, take care. 